What's up? Welcome to a new episode of Movie Schmovie. This is episode number 262. Uh, this is Steve. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. Who else is here with me? I'm Ron. And I'm John. And that was great, guys. There was a really nice delay. Like, nothing felt weird or like we weren't in the same room together. So... <laughs> We are really getting the hang of this. Now it will really be weird if we are actually in the same room together. It will. You're right. There's totally going to be some weird awkwardness if we're like looking into each other's eyes and like not waiting to make sure we don't <laughs> talk over one another. You know, like, did I see that lip quiver? I'm used to recording in my underwear at this point, too. So, well, I, yeah, aware, I mean, that, you, can, you can still do that. I don't think there's no like policy in John's house that you have to wear pants from what I read. Okay. Everything's negotiable. You know that. Uh, the, uh, one thing I've gotten used to doing is I, I have my mic set up, so it's sort of a standing microphone, um, and I pace around sometimes while we're talking. Oh. Um, <clears throat> helps, me, helps me take it in. Helps me ponder. So yes, we've developed weird habits. I, I was thinking today, I don't know how many episodes this is into the, uh, the quarantine times, but um, this is, gosh, you know, this is like, we, I think we've recorded more episodes during this uh, uh, quarantine than we did all of last year. I think that's right. And in that way, COVID is a gift. <laughs> Sounds very weird. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There's the bright side. <laughs> the bright side to all the death. <laughs> Silver linings everywhere. Yeah. So how have you guys been doing? Not much different week after week. They all, they're all blending together as you both, I'm sure, know. I've been picking up hobbies, man. Hobbies, really? Such as? Yeah, I, I've made some um, some vegan ice cream. Homemade vegan ice cream with a coconut, uh, a condensed <clears throat> coconut milk base. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible. <laughs> wow. It's incredible. I, I could not have. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I, I got I to gotta make some and, and bring some over. It's, it's super simple. Ice cream's a lot more simple to make than I thought. And I think I was getting to a point where I was spending more money on ice cream than I would have wanted. <laughs> I know that sounds weird. <laughs> With vegan ice cream, it could be a little pricey, man, for the pint. Right. So I was like, let me make some and see what happens. And I made some strawberry ice cream uh, a couple of days ago. And I ordered uh, one of those little containers, like uh, silicone containers, yeah. about four of those. I'm going to make a couple flavors. That's awesome. Well, I've got two things to say about that, Ronald. One is it sounds like you're trying to get out of buying Steve and I <laughs> ice cream the same. at the Charmery <laughs> no. that, you, that you owe us. And the other is that I love that it, in times of great sacrifice, what you've done is you've, you've learned how to make ice cream at home <laughs> <laughs> as your sort of adjustment to, yeah, to the man. times that we live trying in. Trying it all. Now, we go through a carton faster than we used to as well. So, uh, um, But, the, but it, it's the vegan angle that sounds really cool to me. Like, I've done homemade ice cream, and I really love it. But um, what flavors have you made that you really like? I, mean, I made strawberry the other day. I made, like, a vanilla one. But strawberry is probably the best, man, because I took some frozen strawberries and mixed it up. You basically take, like, a little bit of salt, a little bit of vanilla, the condensed uh, coconut milk. And then a little bit of like whatever sugar you want to use, because um, sometimes the the milk isn't the condensed milk or whatever you choose isn't too sweet. And then you put a whatever whatever flavor you want in. So this weekend I'm going to do butter pecan, and I cannot wait to do this. I'm like excited, excited, man. Yeah, man. I, that sounds good. I think good. that's the key to being sane is you kind of create these, you know, fun things to do. Right. Let my fiance taste it. Maybe she'll love it. Yeah, chill and watch some TV. <laughs> well, that's a good segue, Ronald, to us talking about the things that we've watched. But before we get to the things we've watched, does anybody have any news that we want to talk about? I know that we kind of mentioned that we might generally uh, continue our ongoing conversation about all the adjustments that the um, that the studios and the theaters are making to this this new era. Yeah, I mean, basically, like. What it comes down to is when Universal started releasing a lot of their, you know, PVOD titles during the quarantine, you know, there was all this backlash against, really against them from like AMC and I think I think maybe Regal as well, basically kind of just putting it out there that, you know, this is going to be something, if this is going to be something you're going to do, you know, basically we're not going to show your movies, which, you know, is ludicrous. We talked about this on the podcast. There's no way that that would be a real thing. You know, Universal has some of the biggest titles, franchises, IP 
that that's out there still out. I mean, especially outside of Disney, they have some pretty big franchises, uh, you know, still in their arsenal. But you know, and that felt like forever ago that, that conversation happened. But it was only really a couple months ago. But yeah, here we are this week, and basically, studio. Universal Studios, Universal Pictures, basically comes out saying that their releases, as well as films from their indie arm, which is Focus Features, um, they'll have an option to basically make those titles available on the POV, PVOD platform after just three weekends of a movie being in a theater. And that's with AMC specifically. That's apparently what this um, agreement is is with at this time. But um, I, I mean, if that's a thing and that's a real thing that's going to happen, which it sounds like it absolutely is, there's there's got to be some sort of, you know, pay to play coming along with the other theater chains. And, you know, it's kind of crazy. I mean, I, I mean, I sent you guys like a message on our thread when I saw the article. And I mean, I think this is like really massive news, like in terms of what we talk about a lot on this podcast, you know, in terms of accessibility to movies and like how people watch movies and yeah um you know they're kind of the one that came out of the gate you know very aggressive um in terms of you know saying we're pushing certain movies off to you know a year from now and the other ones we're basically going to put them on a, a premium platform for rental digitally and they've kind of stayed out of the news for the most part in terms of like, you know, moving dates around and being unsure of what they're doing with movies, et cetera. But now this is the conversation that really is going to drive what the future of movies looks like, which is simply, you know, how do you protect the theatrical experience and, ins- and ensure it for people that really want to still experience it? And especially, you know, certain types of movies that lend themselves to you want to see this in a theater for sure. Um, but you know, there's got to be a sweet spot. And I mean, if I'm speaking for myself, I think this is a really interesting idea and I actually kind of love the idea because it, it kind of, they have their foot in both, you know, on both sides of the fence, I guess, or whatever that saying is, it's just, you know, they're still making titles available, um, you know, theatrically so that you can have the theatrical experience. And if you look at the numbers, if you look at the math, you know, the drop off weekend after weekend after weekend. If you look at the first three weekends for most movies, you know, being able to exercise that option to put them on a platform digitally from a studio standpoint is huge because some people may just want to wait for that. And some people still want to go to the theaters. And if you look at most movies that come out in theaters now, you know, if they're not like Black Panther or Get Out or The Greatest Showman, like movies that increase week over week in terms of box office or drop off really, really slightly week after week. By the third or fourth week, some of these movies are out of the theaters already. So the protection of that experience is already kind of passed. And, um, you know, while a title may still be in conversation and, you know, on social media or if it's kind of making the rounds with marketing and television and online advertising, it's good to be able to relay that from a business standpoint and go right to a video window where you could rent it from home. Um, and, and, it, and, and again, that's an option to exercise that. That's not a, every title is going to be that because, you know, for sure, if they have a movie that's only dropping 10 to 15% week after week, they're not going to take that and put it digital. They're going to leave it in theaters because they're making a lot of money still that way. But for, you know, a lot of their movies that come out and drop, 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 week after week or whatever that looks like. Um, this is just a really interesting idea. And I, I, I genuinely think this is going to like change movies like period. Like this is huge news and it's been met with a lot of divisiveness and um, you know, what it, what it looks like in practice versus what they're discussing right now. Uh, you know, that remains to be seen and how often they exercise this option and what other studios come along and try to do the same thing. Um, it'll be interesting between now and the time that movies really pick back up in the theatrical, you know, in, in that, uh, type of venue. But, um, I don't know, man, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that the three of us could go see a movie even, you know, and love this movie. And it, maybe it's like a niche thing that doesn't have legs in the theaters and three and three weeks later, like we could literally buy the movie and have it, you know, like it's just, that's just wild to me you know and you know it allows the audience or the customer to filter out what they deem 
that they want to spend their money on, but still not lose them as a customer because they can just wait and still buy it, you know, from a studio standpoint. But I don't know. What do you, what do you, I guess I'm curious, like Ronald, like what do you think? Cause I mean, I know you buy a lot of stuff digitally, like movies that you've already seen, some that you've never seen. And, you know, I think all of us do that, but I mean like you, I know have done some of these, you know, different options, like where you're actually buying the movie from the, exhibitor you know these e-tickets and you know you've have a lot of exposure to a lot of these different platforms that they're rolling out like what what is your initial gut reaction to an announcement like that where you'd be able to you know see a movie you know own a movie in some way or, or rent a movie rather some way digitally within you know a matter of three weeks i guess first and foremost i guess it has to be said that the home experience has changed a lot from when we were younger um in fact, yeah. um, I remember when I was younger, my dad would pretty much piece together the closest thing to a surround sound setup that he could do for the money. You know, he'd right. get, you know, a couple big studio, a uh, couple big uh, speakers, kind of throw the sound around the room. Now I can have a, a sound bar that can throw sound in a room like that setup that costs maybe hundreds of dollars, depending on where you go. For for some people, thousands of dollars, right? So we have a, a closer to a home theater experience that we've ever had in our lives. If you have a a forty inch or up screen, you don't really have to go anywhere if you don't want to. I mean, let's be honest. If you didn't want to, um, you know, I I love the theater experience. I do, man. I really do. Um, but there's something to be said about what this is doing. And one of the things that really scared me about the system that we had in place was sometimes it felt like movies went into basic obs- ob- obscurity after they left the theater in this right. in this limbo where you kind of didn't know when it was ever going to come out right so now with let's let's be honest man my 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 my, my girl's gotten me since she she's a lawyer and jargon kind of you know I've been paying more attention to the way that people word things they have the option to put it on VOD. So if you have something bigger like, a, let's say, like Fast and the Furious, that might be a little longer, but it's still going to narrow the, the, the window. So if, if it takes 30 days for Fast and the Furious versus 17 for something that's smaller, why right. the fuck not? That sounds incredible. Um, there was a movie, um, Lucky Grandma, that I had the pleasure of... So Fandango put this ad up about Lucky Grandma. I'd heard about it for quite some time. Um, it's it's a really cool niche sort of thing that I feel like wouldn't have necessarily worked in a the theater the way that it would have on VOD. So it said that it was out. I couldn't. I literally couldn't find it on iTunes. I couldn't find it on Fandango, Vimeo, anything. And come to find out, Bowtie Theater was doing this VOD service for day and date release of this movie which i hadn't experienced in this way before i i I literally hadn't been in a position where the only place where you can buy it is a movie theater sometimes it'd be the other way you know you could find it on itunes you can find it on fandango or something like that but this was the first time that i did it and it was honestly it wound up it wound up being through vimeo so what what it did Mm. was it led me to a private vimeo link that was probably that's probably searchable if you know some nerdy searching, and what I wound up getting <laughs> was a copy of this movie, like a, a DRM free. That's you know uh, digital rights, the restriction on the on the film. I got a raw version of this movie for essentially twelve ninety nine that I could share with a friend, that I could put on a server for people to access, and it felt. Honestly, it felt a little like dirty, <laughs> but it felt good. It's it's one of those things, man. Like it it works, it works. But there has to be some ironing out of the system. Like obviously, there has to be some. Um, oh, I think one thing they have to be super careful about is the release of the the date for the VOD. What that what they're gonna have to do, which I think they should do. Regardless of if you know about this window or not, is you can't really tell people that it's coming out on VOD until towards maybe the end of the theater run. Because I feel like people are always going to opt out of not seeing it in a theater 
And there's something about seeing two simultaneous dates that'll make you not want to go to the theater. If I see that it's coming out on August 3rd, but then it's also coming out on VOD on September 3rd or September or August 27th, or so, I'm not going to want to go see that in the theater. So I think they're going to have to find a delicate way of telling us, hey, this movie's out. And then maybe on the 15th day of this thing's run or the 10th, maybe that's when you tell people it's going to be on VOD, whatever date. It's just something I think they have to be careful about that. I know that sounds weird, but that should be some sort of agreement on how the dates are released. I'm not sure about the psychology, like the marketing psychology behind that, Ronald, but I do think that what we're kind of talking around here is the fact that we know that. The bigger movies that, as you said, Steve, hold on to that second, third, fourth weekend box office to any extent um, are not going to be coming out uh, at home so quickly. But we're also going into a different landscape cinematically. And what people are going to go out and see is, you know, I know my big decision is still going to be based on the thinking we've been talking about this whole time, which is that we're in no hurry to go back to the theaters until we know that it's a bit of a safer world out there. But I don't think any of us on this uh, on this phone call think of ourselves as guys who wait for those big moments that are out and that people are talking about. So the notion that I'm now going to turn into a guy who waits four or five weeks to see the big movie that just came out, I don't I don't know how to reconcile that. So I think this whole thing that, that Universal and AMC struck, I think that it, it hints at the way forward, and it is exciting, and it feels like big news, because it means they can address both sides of that equation and say, okay, the people that want to watch it at home don't have to wait so long. People who want to see it in theaters and studios that want to make money, we still have theatrical releases. But then you have this other thing of, but there are some people who love theatrical releases and that experience and are not in any hurry to go back to the theaters right now. And that's a different scenario. So so you could say long term, this new deal hints at like what that might look like, the staging of a movie's release to get it to people who, who can't see it in the theaters uh, sooner. But right now, there's another thing, which is like movies like Tenet are going to have an overseas release and then some limited <laughs> releases. You know what I mean? Like like yeah. the, when, when these movies are finally coming out, it's not coming out into the world that is built to give them the best theatrical reaction. So I wonder, I really wonder what this is going to mean in a year or two years from now where these movies are going to be planned knowing the, whatever the new situation is. But right now we have all these homeless blockbusters that are just looking for a place to come out and a way to exist. Um, and I don't think this quite addresses that. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that like you, Tenet, Tenet, I don't know if you guys read, but the plan is to, it's going to have like an international release, and then does it have any theaters here and there in the States? Yeah, international release, <clears throat> I want to say it's uh, August 26th, and then in whatever theaters are open in the U.S. over Labor Day weekend. Does that mean it's going to be on VOD soon after that? No. Steve, no. No, no. I, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, well, yeah, I, I don't, well, no, I, I don't think it means that, I mean, mainly because, you know... Well, I mean, what we're talking about is a Warner Brothers title, so they haven't agreed to allow that theatrical window to rela- to, re- to collapse like Universal has. So, you know, Tenet, if it hits theaters on September, whatever that, you know, whatever that date is, I can't remember the date, like Labor Day weekend, and whatever ones that are open, I mean, I think their intention is, you know, the reality that you got to acknowledge is there's no other movies playing either. So it's not like, you yeah. know, there's some massive rush to force a movie out for for re, for for real estate that you usually see in you know every week at four movies come out you know like tenant can come out here and you know if theaters slowly open or if the world improves or heals in any way it could still be playing its theatrical run in november you know or into december you know we just don't know what it looks like but yeah i, I don't see them collapsing that window for that kind of a movie, I mean, it's definitely something where they're hoping internationally it does well, like a lot of his movies do. But yeah, no, if it, I, I feel like it comes out here, whoever wants to go see it sees it. If their theaters are open, you know, the chains are still kind of holding to, you know, end of August, early September opening kind of time to that. If that happens, um, and there's nothing to say between now and then if it changes again. I mean, if they've already done it three or four times, but I mean, I think this is the biggest push, you know, over a month back. You know, ahead of time, I mean, um, to delay it. But yeah, I just think, you know, it's kind of all these little moving parts that we keep talking about on this podcast that it's like, 
you know, sure, it comes out. If there's one other movie out with it or two other movies out with it at the multiplex that has 20 screens, you know, like there's no rush to get Tenet anywhere out. I mean, it's going to be one of the biggest movies out in the fall until Wonder Woman comes out, if it comes out, or, you know, Milan or, or whatever else actually comes out this fall. But I think it's going to be a weird situation where it just stays and they keep promoting it if if it's able to open and, you know, you know, eventually an audience may find it, you know, not not that, you know, that's the kind of movie that this is. But I'm talking more just like, you know, major markets opening back up, you know, like L.A. or California, you know, like they, they, they seem to be getting worse. So it's like, I don't know that movie theaters, you know, that's a major market or Chicago or, you know. Uh, down in Florida, you know, like Miami, like major, like top 10 markets that they can't open theaters like these, it's not going to make money here for months until those markets do open and people actually want to go see it in the theater. It's an interesting thought that, yeah, Tenet could be the the movie that, you know, it looks like, boy, held over for a, for a record-breaking week, uh, you know, week 24, week 25. That kind of stuff hasn't happened in decades. So, you know, maybe yeah. Christopher Nolan sees that opportunity uh, as a way to be a movie that, that has some cultural, uh, uh, like, some legs to it, because it is sure. in theaters for a while, and because it is one of the only big movies that is coming out. And the other thing is the, the worldwide box office is nothing to sneeze at, and in in fact, we've been saying for years how movie it's it's gradually become more and more important that big uh, four quadrant tentpole movies play to the international audience. There's something that uh, I've been thinking about a lot with the tenant release, especially. This is such a weird thing to bring up, but it's true and it's going to happen. Um, it's going to all these theaters internationally first. I don't think that a lot of people are necessarily going to be in those theaters. Um, we are going to have high quality bootleg versions of tenant before it hits the US and i think that's a problem i think there should be some consideration for that and it should come out on pay vod because it's going to with with that happening with those empty theaters with people not necessarily wanting to go to the theaters and it coming out internationally and within the theaters that's there's a high chance that we're going to get a high quality version of a bootleg of this movie very early which is something that they really should consider. Pay VOD would wipe that out. I think they'd make the money. I, um, I, I'm just not sure if this is smart. It just doesn't feel like nothing they're saying about the release of this sounds smart. Breaking it up sounds, sounds like uh, something that works for them for maybe to save face, but it just seems ridiculous. The more they plan around it and delay it, you know, so... I think I think the more interesting release at this point. I mean, I feel like Tenant has kind of become, you know, it's like a it's kind of like a talking point this whole time to see if it would actually meet its release. But I mean, I think that's that is a title like that could definitely you know still do really well overseas, like we've been saying. But you know, here domestically, I think the more interesting one to watch is Wonder Woman because you know whatever happens over the next month or so with covid and theatrical window you know the theatrical theaters opening you know the sorry the theaters opening up if they stick to their dates whatever you know wonder woman being i think it's like october 2nd right now um i guess i know, just keep picturing it getting it getting pushed back but maybe it, it, it'll actually hit that date and it very well could but i mean this whole time the conversation about like tenant being like what brings people back to theaters like you know domestically and worldwide but just speaking domestically I think Wonder Woman is a more interesting movie to watch in terms of it holding its date or when it actually comes out here because that is kind of like a rare instance of a blockbuster type of movie that made more money domestically than it did internationally. And, you know, over half of its global gross was was US-based or North America-based. So it's like, you know here where theaters are still behind and and our you know our reaction to covid is behind and and you know we're still trying to figure this out like and you know everything is suffering because because of it but like wonder woman being a movie that did do better domestically than it did internationally would be a more interesting movie to watch to see if that's actually hitting its date that could be something that is the one that really brings you know america back into movie theaters for those willing to do so in terms of, you know, financial success and also just like attendance. You know what I mean? I, I really, I really hope that 
it, Wonder Woman, I'm fighting for Wonder Woman, especially because of the momentum that the first one had. And yeah, I want it to win. Um, but I, I don't know how many people are going to come out to see it. But I hope that they figure out a way for this thing to, to for them to have some metric of how well it's going to do. It does well. And that prompts them to a make another Wonder Woman and B, I guess, a first more women directors and B making another Wonder Woman movie. Right. Right. It's like, I don't feel like we know what it's going to be like in October right now. Maybe it'll just be the continuing blurring of time and suddenly it'll be October or November and it will feel very much like now, in which case putting out a movie like Wonder Woman is like, well, hey, why not? You know, I guess it still feels a little bit like throwing it to the wolves or something or throwing it out. But the movies that have been taken off the schedule entirely or pushed till next year, I think we were talking about this last time, how that always that's beginning to feel like that was the smarter move in the long run. And I, th- and I think some studios really are approaching it or, or trying to catch up to that kind of thing where you know they, they know they can't leave these movies on these dates in the fall or the winter they're not confident that they're gonna you know make their money back or, or, or really realize the the grosses that they could with these properties you know paramount taking quiet place two off until next year you know top gun maverick you know pulled off of the holiday release like till next year to next summer like those are big moves, like not not un- unscheduled moves, but I mean they're giving them dates, but they're you know next year, twenty twenty one. Like we're talking, you know, eight months from now minimum, and you know that's that's what it seems like a lot. You know, same thing with I think Mulan was taken off the schedule. Um, I don't know if that was given another date, but I, I feel like that came off the schedule too. No, I don't think it's been given a date yet. And then, and then all the Avatar movies and the Star Wars movies that were sort right. of like Star Wars everything. scheduled yeah. for like one year after the other or alternating years. Those have all been pushed back just one year. And so, seeing right. things like Avatar Five has been pushed back from 2027 to 2028, <laughs> it starts to make my head hurt. You know, it's like yeah. uh, I, a that there's going to be that there's going to be an Avatar Five, but also just that that planning just because we've been kind of freed from it this year um, doesn't mean that that kind of, you know, those those announcements where they tell you what the next 10 years of movies are going to be. Sure. Um, I, I, I don't miss those. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, a, yeah. a part of me will be a little bit sad if things kind of lurch back into action the way they were before. I honestly wonder if people involved in some of these big giant films are taking this as a chance to sort of like take a little more time and, and, and you know, maybe maybe whatever that assembly line is of some of these movies that people comment on, maybe, maybe Marvel can shake it up. Maybe star Wars can shake it up. Maybe, maybe, well, who knows what uh, James Cameron's going to do. He's going to do what he's going to do. But you know what I'm saying though, that that a little bit of extra time kind of means that whatever you were planning on rushing to, to market with, now you can sit back and say, well, now we have time to actually address whatever concerns there might be. So um, I'm still surprised at movies that are shooting now and are, are saying they're going to finish and be out next year. You know, there's, there's, there's weird little pockets of production happening. And, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm very skeptical of all of it. I just feel like everything is going to lead to more uh, COVID cases <laughs> and it's ultimately going to lead to uh, a longer shutdown. But, you know, that's just me being cynical, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree, man. I agree. Well, some movies actually have come out, and we've seen them. And I think we found out right before we started this that uh, we all saw The Rental, right? Yes. Uh, Dave Franco's first directorial film. And uh, I, I had I had seen this thinking I need to always at least see one horror movie so that I can, I can keep my feature horror you doing going. So <laughs> I guess maybe now we, should, we could do a, th- a three-man uh, horror you doing uh, segment uh, about The Rental. What did you guys think of... Uh, of this movie, which I was not sure how much of a genre movie it was, but at, when it got to the end, I was like, "No, that was a horror film. That was straight up a horror movie." Yeah. I I thought it was fun, man. I thought it was a fun movie. Uh, I, I think maybe maybe as we talk about it some more, I'll figure out how I feel about it as a whole. But I think that this movie did a lot of plate spinning, and it effectively kept the plate spinning for most of the movie without crashing them. And that, to me, is a, is a job within itself. You know, kind of having several sort of storylines going simultaneously and tension building between those that I just thought was really cool. Um, it was a take on something that I guess I never thought about. I, you know, I'm going to think twice when I go to an Airbnb from now on. 
<laughs> and I thought about I thought about it before because I go to a ton of Airbnbs. You know, just a, it's a cheap way to just get away. It's it's very weird to think that maybe some of those had some dicey things going on. I'm not trying to give it away, but yeah, I I think that it's it's it spun the plates well enough for me to be interested from start to finish. I was conf- a little confused about the ending, and maybe we can talk about that and and maybe cut that part out. But overall, I thought it was a solid movie. Paint by numbers. I thought it was cool. I liked the characters. Uh, I, th- I liked it. Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, I actually I think I liked it more than Ronald did. I mean, I I really liked this movie. The more I thought about it, um, just you know, it's kind of like a, it's an interesting take on something that's probably crossed anybody's mind that has rented an Airbnb or a Verbo, anything like that. It's just like this idea of like whatever your worst fears are or like your paranoia, and it's like maybe some of those things are realized in some situations. Oftentimes you choose a place because it's remote and there aren't a lot of things close to it. And it's a place you don't really know that much about. And you are sort of pretending you have this bubble of security around yourself when you go to a rental. But then, yeah, you're in someone else's zone. You're in someone else's domicile. So if they wanted to do anything, um, they have access to you. Uh, they know what your plans are. You know what I mean? It's, so it's it is an interesting. Uh, you're right. It's a it's a like if you have horror movie brain as I do, then anytime you've stayed in a rental, you've thought about these things. And it I think different stories have done it. This is far from the first uh, movie or 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 you know attempt to 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 kind of bring that fear into a narrative form but i do think that um that this this is a particularly palpable version of it because it really did feel very familiar something about the way this rental looked and felt and these characters moving around in it and the sort of things they do when they get there this it it definitely felt like a very recognizable uh, uh sort of getaway turned bad and and i think that's like a subgenre that this belongs to that maybe some other horror things. I don't, I really don't want to point to too much what happens because I think there are, are some definite surprises in this, but the idea that whatever it is that happens that escalates this to horror movie territory, when it arrives, these people already have their own shit going on and they already have their own problems to sort out before things really, before the shit hits the fan. And I think that is a cool uh, subgenre of of horror movie with like relatable characters who who suddenly have to deal with something. That idea, like you just said about like you know you get this sense of being in your own bubble where you know I'm I'm doing a Airbnb to kind of get outside of the standard like I'm a hotel or a resort or whatever it might be. You know, just that idea of like security or like you you feel like you're doing your own thing, but then there is a realization sometimes, and you know. You look around sometimes and you're just like, I, I'm kind of in somebody else's bubble. You know, I'm kind of in their environment. And yeah, like you have, you know, if, you, if the cro- thought has ever crossed your mind and it's, it's like something I've thought about before when we've rented them, um, just because I'm a little paranoid myself. And it's like, yeah, it's just a really, I think it's a pretty effective, very efficient. It's only like an hour and a half, I think, with credits. Um, and it moves real quick. And I mean, it's got some interesting character beats and uh, another, another, you know, just feather in the cap of always talk. We just say like how we like Dan Stevens so much. Like I think he's really good in this and um, Allison Breeze in it and Lip from Shameless. I never know his name. Jeremy something. Um, (laughs) uh, Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. I just felt like, I felt like all the performances were pretty good. And um, I don't know. I just, I I like, I like movies that like feel this way. It's, it doesn't really like kind of, fall too far into like the nothing happening like tense slow paced horror movie that we talk about a lot or like the quote elevated horror movie that we talk about a lot i guess some people could probably you know put this in that category possibly but i think enough happens with the characters and enough like with what you actually get to see on the screen that um it kind of didn't feel so much like that to me and you know does really good stuff like with a score just like how how some how, how some of the blocking's done and um, there's a really cool sequence where one of the character is kind of like walking through the house from side to side and the camera's like following her from the outside like through the glass windows it's a really cool like way to map a house and the geography and like um you know we talk about that before too like kind of getting a sense of like a layout for something or you know how big a house is or where stuff is in the house 
so yeah, I don't know. Like when you kind of add all that together and you kind of make it really quick and efficient like this, you don't have to spend a lot of time. And they and and Dave Franco, like this is his first movie he's directed. I thought he did a great job. Like I thought it's really efficient filmmaking. And you know you don't get too bogged down in too many character uh, beats or you know story story devices that we we see in some of these movies to kind of like elongate the, the the movie or make them too long. It feels like sometimes. So I think that's probably one of the best assets this movie has, in, in my opinion, is just that, um, you know, it's quick. Like, there, there, it doesn't linger too far on a lot of scenes. I mean, there are some scenes where you kind of stay in it longer than you might expect, but that's there's a purpose to that, I think, in most cases. Um, and there is a scene um, in the movie that I, I, I thought was great, because, like, I watched it with Aaron, and it was, like, a scene where, like, she had to, like, kind of, like, look away slash, like, hide under her blanket it's uh, it's a scene like towards the end of the movie, but um, and not that it's even scary or grotesque or gruesome. It's just a good scene, like with blocking and like you know, just kind of what you kind of see in the background of a shot, and and how quickly it changes. Um, but yes. I love scenes like that, and like you know, I I saw Aaron in my peripheral, kind of like start to shake a little bit and pull the blanket over her face as as I'm as I was watching the sequence and and anything mm-hmm. that accomplishes that I'm like yeah okay good job I like I like that I like that and and the more I think about it yeah I I really liked it a lot actually well, that's what I mean about the relatable characters Steve is that you picture yeah. yourself doing the same shit walking around in a rental house yeah and absolutely Ronald, Ronald you said you you and Aaron do that as well um where it's like, you know that sometimes you rent more of a house than you need. And so you're kind of wandering around parts of this house at the end of the evening. Maybe you're shutting lights off. Maybe you're checking them to make, to make sure things are locked. Maybe you're just kind of poking around. But there's parts of the house that feel kind of lonely and weird because you're not going to be using that room. Yeah. Or, or it's, you know what I mean? Or it's just a, yeah. a weird uh, downstairs area that you're like, well, this is, we're not really hanging out in here that much in the one weekend we're here. Yeah. So there's that scene where you're talking about, Steve, of the walking around the house and the kind of sense of being watched. I again, I always sort of have that because I I picture horror movie uh, blocking in every situation that I'm in. But I think certain situations, putting it as you're in someone else's bubble, Steve, is a great way to put it. It's like you you are having fun and this, you've staked a claim on this place for whatever amount of time. But somewhere in the back of your head, you know that you are out of your element. Um, and that makes you feel sort of vulnerable. And I think this movie brilliantly captures that, both in terms of just the rental and the way that it's shot. And yeah, the, the camera work, everything, it feels pretty accomplished. And I think the one thing I, I caught myself thinking, oh yeah, Dave Franco, the kind of act, acting he's done in the movies I've enjoyed him in, I felt like he brought some of that quality. It's almost like he said, I'm doing a spin on an elevated horror movie where actually the characters are interesting and... Uh, then th- things actually happen. So it's arguably not uh, the elevated horror I was talking about last time where, where you get to the end and you realize nothing really affected anybody, you know, or at least it's ambiguous. In this, there's definite, definite consequences <laughs> uh, for these poor people. So Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. I, they, play with, they play with things that I've, I just haven't seen in these sorts of ideas. Like, so I've, so you, I've, I've had whole houses to myself but then sometimes when you get shared spaces, um, I was in a house in Pennsylvania that had um, like, it's so hard to describe because I, I had only seen it in this house. It basically had secret passageways that went behind the house. So they could go in and out of the house, drop things off and leave without us even seeing them come through an actual door. It was the most ter- Luckily, I was by myself at the time. It was like right when I <laughs> met Aaron. But it was terrifying because sometimes, I, I, like, I went out to get something out of my car. I was like, "Hey, you, th- you you have some, you know, snacks or whatever." I went to my car, came back, and it was there. Didn't hear anything. Didn't see anything. <laughs> and I was out there for like m- less than ten minutes tops. So it was, you know, things like that. They played with that a lot. Not. You know, the more I think about it, the more I, I, I would watch it again. I would show it to Aaron. Like, it's just one of those films that it had enough elements that I'd rewatch it, man. It, it just, especially the, the central sort of tension that happens before the craziness occurs in the house. I think it's such a cool thing to have in a horror film that that is horror within itself. 
<laughs> revealing of information is just as scary as something terrible happening by a killer. So that is something about playing with those two things simultaneously that I thought was incredible, man. Did, did you guys notice that, uh, I, I know we've talked about him on the podcast before, but I, I'm really a, quite a fan of Joe Swanberg. Did you realize that he co-wrote this with Dave Franco? Yes. I saw yes, that I did. in the credits. What? Yeah, they got that. They got. He's got his own little. He's got his own little uh, like group of people that he's been working with like all the time, man. Like, I feel like between Franco, who was in his series Easy on uh, Netflix, and like Jake Johnson, like uh, he's got all these guys that he like co-writes movies with, who they star in, and then they end up directing their own movies. It's it's pretty cool to see like you know he's kind of like branched out and isn't really just Joe Swanberg, a director or actor, like he's like, you know, writing and letting other people act like not, not in the movies, but like, you know, Franco directed this one. I think initially I was reading an interview. I think initially Dave Franco was not going to direct it. He was supposed to be in the movie as I think the, the brother, the younger brother character in the movie, I think, but, um, Jeremy and, Allen White. Is that, is yes, that the yes, name? yes. Yeah. That's him. That's the lip from, from homecoming. Shane. I, uh shameless i think of well yeah he is also in homecoming you're right yeah he's in season one yeah Yeah, i i i recognize him from shameless he's lip in that series but um he's really good i thought i I thought he was great i loved him in the movie like i i really was like into his character and i you know i felt for his you know just felt for him through the whole movie pretty much yeah he and allison brie really get you to feel for their their characters like as the movie goes along those two characters feel like they're caught up yeah, in, yeah. they're caught up in something worse and then and in then something. things take yeah. an even different turn for uh for his character but the one thing i also i feel like we should mention a guy who's always good um i love that he does voices or did voices for king of the hill um and used to do like mtv oh, yeah. clips back in the day if anyone remembers when he used to do those but toby huss plays taylor the the sort of um the i guess we'll call him the landlord of the property and he does a great job of playing the sort of ambiguous person who you can't tell if everything he's doing is a microaggression or if he's just uh socially awkward um but you know and, and even that character there's some interesting turns with him before we figure out what's really going on and i think that he plays it really well like he's got just that ambiguous middle ground where he's like a little menacing and he seems a little suspicious but then you realize they haven't exactly been treating him that nicely either and they're 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 kind of shitty about him behind his back so i don't know it sets up this tension between the the renters uh, of the property and the the person that's renting it to them. So let's just say right now, let's let, we'll talk spoilers. We're going to cut this out and put it at the end of the episode, maybe because I do think some things happen that we might want to refer to. Um, so yes, folks, if you want to just wait till the end after this theme song, if you want to hear spoilers. But right now, we'll we'll go to our next segment. That that's the equivalent of a movie schmovie stinger. Can we call it that? A, sh- a stinger schminger. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, whatever we want to call it. But like you know how we stay for the Marvel credits. Now you got to stay through the music of the movie schmovie episodes so oh, that's that right you, you hear our spoiler conversation if, if you so if you so <laughs> choose to all right yeah back to what you were saying sorry <clears throat> okay so now we're back in now we're back in the flow of the regular episode and um i i guess we should throw at least a nod to greyhound which we saw steve which ronald you didn't see and maybe you can decide whether you're gonna see it on uh, what steve and i have to say about it what did you think of greyhound steve it was written by tom hanks which is i guess noteworthy but it's directed by Aaron Schneider, who is not a guy who has had a lot of movies on his resume. He's he's on Wikipedia as a cinematographer and director, but he has like a couple of movies he's shot in the last 30 years and a couple of movies he's made <laughs> in the last 20 years. So I don't know why this guy got this movie or what he's been working on in the meantime. It feels kind of random that he's doing this. Um, am I missing something with, uh, with uh, Aaron Schneider? And am I missing something if I thought this movie was... I had a lot to sort of admire about it, but in a way, it was just okay. What did what What did you feel uh, after you got through the brisk ninety minutes of Greyhound? I kind of liked it. I mean, like I don't think it was anything special. I feel like it kind of felt really kind of generic to me. Um, but I thought, like it, again, in talking about like pacing and just something being quick, like it just felt like a couple really cool big battles, and that was the movie. Um, it didn't really feel like I, I kind of walked away from it, kind of feeling like the third act didn't feel as like like epic or like 
uh, consequential. I don't know what the right word is, but it, it just it, it it felt like the movie kind of just ended, and I thought that there was going to be a bigger thing at the end of it. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I liked it. I, I didn't really have any too much negative to say about it. I would probably recommend it to people. Those that I have recommended it to seem to have really liked it. But I mean, it's Tom Hanks also, which is like a a, a give you know a given for me. I, I I will watch anything he's in, but um. I don't know. I thought it had some really cool like sequences, like with the the water, like the water battles, like you know, with the U boats, um, and kind of made them kind of creepy at, at times, and like kind of gave some perspective on how unseen and unheard they were um, during during that time, and like you know, a, a transport like this. But overall, yeah, I, I would agree with you. It kind of didn't feel like anything anything special. You know, you touched on a couple of the things that I really uh, I really. I really do think are worth mentioning, though. The fact that you said the U-boats were sort of creepy. I would say overall, this movie was scary. Like, it played almost like a horror movie in the sense of the soundtrack, which was, uh, I think, Blake Neely is the is the composer's name. Um, there were some parts that were like straight up orchestral Hollywood score, but there were also lots of parts where it's almost like, it sounds like whale song or something. It was real echoey and, and eerie. And it did play around with the, the idea that the U-boats are these kind of predatory creatures almost, even with, when they are given a voice, it's the voice of this taunting, uh, uh, German, (laughs) uh, you know, that's communicating via the, the radio with the, with the soldiers on the, on the Greyhound. And, um, and it's just, it's played again. It's similar to the horror movie where the killer calls you and says, uh, I know what you're wearing and hangs up or something. I mean, it just had this kind of taunting evil quality that had to be deliberate that they were playing the fear, the legitimate fear, but almost creating an otherworldly sense of, of this adversary. That part was pretty cool. And yeah, the, the, the economic pacing is kind of part of the problem as well as what made this movie watchable is that it did move at a nice clip, but you're right that, I mean, I'm always interested in a movie that sort of tries a protagonist free approach to storytelling, but this, it never quite clicks. And this movie almost gets there, like with a sense of that the adventure or the story that you're watching is what you need to see. And the action reveals all the character you need to know. But there's just enough sort of anonymous uh, uh, crewmen running around, and Tom Hanks is is sort of not given enough moral shading to make him that interesting of a character. It's really just interesting to see anyone <laughs> deal with what he has to deal with. And it kind of reminded me, there's this new uh, category of uh, Tom Hanks movies uh, like Captain Phillips and Bridge of Spies and this, where he's just miserable the whole time and at the end you see the effects of all that on him like the, the whole the point of the movie is to see at the end how how fucked up he is you know um at the end of bridge of spies remember like he spends that whole movie with a cold just wanting to go home and lay down uh and in this right, movie it was right. a similar kind of thing where he, this guy's kind of working himself to death that's like the most character you get and it's pretty interesting the way that it's revealed and even as i talk about it i do think it is as you said steve it's very recommendable as a streaming movie you can just watch if you're a subscriber to apple uh, uh, TV plus. It's just that it's pretty amazing for a TV movie. I don't know what the fortunes of this movie might have been like, though, if this had been a theatrical release. I, I might be crazy to think that it would have just uh, had a middling response, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it's more interesting to people uh, than it was to me. But I have to say, I spent the first 15, 20 minutes of this movie kind of being bored by it until it clicked into that pace, it, which then it really doesn't let up, which is cool. But it took me, I was ready to, to write it off as kind of a gray, drab, as you said, generic movie until it started to reveal that it had a, a little bit of a different take on the war movie. It was very specific to a certain story, uh, similar to Dunkirk or uh, even 1917 or something like that, where it's it's giving you the whole war in a way, but it's also zeroing in on a particular story. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out, man. But Steve, any thoughts on Aaron Schneider before we before we move on? Like, do you do, what, who is he, how does he get this movie? I have nothing to add. I, I really honestly didn't look too much... I didn't look too much into who uh, who made the movie, like you know, into his IMDb or anything like that. But I, yeah, I, I did recall like just glancing at it and not being, <clears throat> excuse me, not being familiar with him at all. I do remember seeing his movie. Um, he did a movie with uh, Fassbender a couple years ago that I really liked called Get Low. I thought Bill Murray was in Get Low. No, no, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, Lucas Black is who I'm thinking of. Lucas Black, yeah, Bill Murray's in it. 
Um, I thought that was pretty good, actually. That was a pretty good movie. That came out like a decade ago or something. It's It's been a while. But that's the only thing I remembered when looking at his IMDb. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he just, like, is friends with Tom Hanks' kids or something. I don't know. I mean, it's a pretty good gig for that guy. Yeah. But it does feel a little bit like... it. it I mean, I, I keep wanting to say that it was kind of blandly directed, but everything we talked about as a strength is kind of a directorial aspect. It's like the fact that it had the feel. It, it made the the ocean scary. It made the speed these, these ships are cruising at kind of imposing and... And you really sort of felt the water splashing up on your face. You know what I mean? And, and in a sense that I don't know that you can create that without having a, a good visual sense. But there were other ways that it just felt like kind of modern movie making, just CGI everything. I don't know. What do you think this movie would have done theatrically? Like, do you think in, in a perfect world this would have been a big hit? No, no, I don't. No, yeah. I I mean, only because I don't think it, I don't think it has like, you know, it has like the... The you know based on the true story, true of, it has all that stuff that they usually market this stuff around and kind of play into. But you know, unlike you know Captain Phillips, like you mentioned, is I mean I think one of Tom Hanks's best performances, and I love that movie. Um, just like I know you do, John. Um, I I just think I just think you know it it's something that just seems it just seems too it just seems too generic. Like it doesn't it doesn't have a hook. It doesn't have um anything that really felt like unique um and you know i don't know yeah i i I definitely was curious to see what this movie would do in theaters um but i i got if i was betting i would i would not even i would be i would bet it wouldn't even gross 40 million like it's something like below that like yeah I'll, I'll check it out. It's free, so and it's and it's ninety minutes. That I will say that like the the stuff that really that really. I gosh, I was about to sound like I was making a terrible pun. The stuff that really sinks it though <laughs> is uh, there's a little bit of a wraparound with Elizabeth Shue that just shouldn't be there at all. As long at as you're all. streamlining this movie yeah. as much as they streamlined it, the little bit of like outside life they try to give Tom Hanks's character, it feels so corny and un- really unnecessary to the extreme uh, that uh, I would almost say just come in five minutes late or something and. You will miss that stuff entirely and then leave the second you start to see Elizabeth Shue just turn around and walk, run, run. <laughs> um, so, Ronald, did you watch anything else uh, this week or last couple weeks? Um, movie wise, um, I, I, uh, yes, quite a few movies. Um, Sauter Rental, um, Lucky Grandma. Should we talk about that? Yeah, talk about that. I, I saw that. I really enjoyed Lucky Grandma. What did you think? <sighs> Man, look. I, I, I don't want to the issue the issue with this movie is I don't want you to see the trailer because the trailer gives away so much of the spice of this movie because some of it is kind of watching stuff unravel in front of you you know how the way that it escalates um, I guess what, what I what I could say is this is the best mob movie I've ever seen that that doesn't that isn't a mob movie um, it has so much character to it. Um, the grandmother is so incredibly interesting. She has so much soul to her that I could watch several movies of her getting into hijinks, man. Um, I I don't think I've ever seen a movie where someone that old gets into hijinks and it feels like she's so credible, so believable. Um, so on the edge of danger <laughs> and somehow weasels her way into, you know, in and out of this danger in a way that just feels so believable in her own way, man. Like it just, it's a movie that takes place in New York that doesn't feel like it takes place in New York somehow. I, I did not watch the trailer, so I did not, I wouldn't be able to say how much of the story it ruins, but I, I think not knowing from frame one how far this movie was going to go really made it quite fun <laughs> when it gets to certain moments because you really do discover the uh, the uh, um, you know w- like what the scope of the movie is and and so you there are, there is real danger but there's also a lot of situations where this movie tries to show you the kind of mundane side of you know kind of being at the fringe of this this drug world this this gang world that she's found herself in basically she just comes into some money that is not hers and the people who who feel they they 
they should have that money are, are sniffing around and it just kind of c- goes from there. And yeah, the, what she gets involved with and her kind of little group of friends that she forms, it's uh, <laughs> it was really funny. And, and I agree with you, Ronald, as far as being kind of a genre mix, like a comedy, like a, a gangland comedy. Um, this was a, a fresh take that I, I wasn't even looking for. I had no idea about this filmmaker. I, what's her name? Um, Stacey Seeley looks like. Um, but yes, she's uh, someone I'll be watching. Yeah, man, this is one you do not want to miss. It is such a gem, man. It it's one of the better movies I've seen in years. Like it just has a perspective. And the music is great too. The, what is the music? I it's it's like this. It's so great. <laughs> swelling, intense, like horn based. It 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 is crazy. Like a lot of heavy drums. It's it's oh man. I, I think I didn't see the trailer before I saw the movie, but I watched the trailer after I saw it because I'd heard about this movie for quite some time. I, I didn't know if it was going to get distribution in the way that I, I just thought it kind of disappeared. And then when I found out that it was coming out via Instagram post that Fandango put up saying that it was out now and I wound up getting it through the theater. Um, this was a gem, man. In a way that, like, I won't, I won't forget it. I'll suggest it to damn near anybody that's like, I'm tired of seeing the same shit. I'm like, well, I got something for you, and I love that these people don't feel like somehow they feel like they're your relative somehow, man. Like somehow in this in this story, it's done a way to it's found a way to be completely unique. And these people are not from a world that I come from, but they also feel like my family somehow and you know you get you get so worried for everybody involved you start caring for people so much that it just is such a well-told story with a lot of twists and turns that i really enjoyed so i think you dig it steve yeah i definitely want to check it out sounds really good anybody see anything else sure um i saw the remix hip-hop uh and fashion which is a netflix movie about basically how urban fashion affected high-end fashion um, and they point to some direct names, uh, Dapper Dan and uh, a couple other people. Um, but it's a really well-told documentary that works really well. Um, please see that. Inmate number one, The Rise of Danny Trejo. Man, <laughs> his life is fucking crazy. And he's like in his 70s at this point, I'm pretty sure. Um, let me just check his age. Uh, just to be, uh, he's seventy six. The fact that he did um, Machete, like what, three four years ago, um, is I, f- I feel like it's got to be longer than that. <clears throat> it's it's insane, man. Because they talk about you know where he was physically when he did that movie. Uh, you know how old he was, and he's he's had a rough life, man. Like not regular, like his. He grew up a lot of, around a lot of gang banging and drug usage, and he found a way to recreate himself. And it started with him playing gang banger number one, essay number two, and until he moved up to be uh, <laughs> number one gangster uh, in in a in a film, and kind of leveraged that to become the force that we see him. Um, it's it's such a good documentary, man. It's a feel good thing that I think that anybody that's a fan of him should see, especially if you don't know much about him. I'm, I happen to know a little bit about him, but um, yeah, it's it's a it's a good documentary. Machete, the film, the first one. So that means it was after it was a trailer, but Machete came out in 2010. So that's that's how old we are. Jesus Christ, time time flying. Um, and then. Uh, I saw two do- two HBO documentaries, uh, The Way to Gold, which is about uh, Olympic athletes and depression and how um, basically when athletes aren't doing anything in the time in between uh, exercising, uh, they go into these deep depressions, man. And sometimes the anxiety to perform can drive people to, you know, commit suicide, hurt themselves, um, act out in strange ways. Um, I had this weird take because I went to the same high school as uh, Mike Phelps and, you know, he was we were celebrating this guy at a time that it, it's a strange time to be held up the way that he was held up. 
and it does something to you, man. It, 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 it creates this standard of living that won't last forever, that seems like it'll last forever. And I could see that firsthand going to Towson High School and seeing the, the way that he was treated. Um, it's a cool documentary just because it, 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 it brings some light to stuff. I, I kind of wish it was a little more balanced, but it was worth watching. And then the last movie that I wanted to talk about was Stock, Stockton on My Mind, which is about uh, Michael Tubbs, uh, the mayor of Stockton, California. He's 20, at the time of the filming, 28 or 29 years old. Um, it's an incredible piece of work that kind of talks about a, a kid that comes from Stockton, a very neglected, violent, um, let's compare it to Detroit. It's like the Detroit of California, um, kind of left behind city that this kid is trying to turn around. He comes from uh, a gangbanger father who is doing life in, life in jail for a robbery and kidnapping. You get more time for a kidnapping than you do for killing somebody in California, just to let you guys know. You get life for kidnapping and uh, you get 20 years sometimes for killing. So I'm sorry, I said that weird. You get um, life for kidnapping and you take a life, you can get 20 years. So you can get out of jail in 20 years for killing somebody, but you can be in jail forever for robbing somebody and kidnapping them. So they talk a lot about that. No, those, those, those disparities are crazy whenever someone points them out to yes. you. It doesn't really make sense. It feels so arbitrary. It's so strange, man. But this documentary is about a, a guy that has these very new ideas. Um, he basically has this idea to randomly give money to low-income housing, um, uh, houses with uh, low-income parents, and just randomly chooses people within those areas and gives them like a stipend, essentially. Um, and people hate it, and people hate him because of it. Um, but to see him working and putting his money where his mouth is uh, is, is inspirational, man. Uh, Stockton on my mind, HBO documentary. Michael Tubbs is the, the mayor. I think he's going to wind up going to the uh, governor or something like that. But it's a documentary worth checking out. So That's the last of the movies I've seen. I think the only other thing I've really watched was, um, well, I, I finally watched Last Christmas from last winter, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> randomly, that was my Friday night cross-country movie night with my friends out in Arizona. We we It's been on our wheel of movie selections for about a month now, and it finally won, so... We literally have this app where we just put we each pick a movie and we put it on a wheel, we spin it, and like that's the movie we watch. And and it's like lost three weeks in a row. I finally watched that. It was eh, it was whatever, um, passable. Um, but I did. Uh, I was going to mention John. I, I watched Relic, which I thought was I thought was okay. Um, I thought it had some really creepy scenes and some really good. Um, like kind of set pieces, just the way they kind of make the house. Um, I don't know, not, not any kind of spoilers, but like the way they kind of make the ha house, uh, kind of deteriorate or appear deteriorating much like, uh, one of the main characters is, is I thought was pretty cool. Um, definitely I'm curious like what that filmmaker does next. Cause I thought there's pro a lot of kind of promise in that movie. Oh, totally. I, the atmosphere was great. I just kind of oh, felt yeah. like by the time it got to the end, Off the I was kind of like, oh, okay. Yeah. Do you know what I was saying too about the sound design? Yes. Uh, yes. Just how there's some really creepy noises throughout and it's like, you don't know if it's wood or teeth grinding or, or bones creaking or what, uh, throat noises, it's some really weird shit. Yeah. But yeah, I'd, <laughs> I'd recommend checking that out if you haven't seen it yet. The other one, the only other one I was going to mention that I watched was, um, I don't even... I guess in the States, it's called The Shadow of Violence, but I think the original title of the movie is called Calm with Horses. Um, have, you, have either of you heard of this movie? It like, popped up on one of my uh, blogs I follow. No. no. But, um, I mean, the only people... You, you may recognize, like, Barry Keoghan, who's in it. He was in, like, American Animals. Um, some other Irish actors, like David Wilmot, you've probably seen in other movies. But it's basically just about, like, this, you know... This, uh, I guess he's the muscle in this little, you know, Irish gang. Um, 
not so much a gangster movie or mob movie, but just about a guy who's kind of caught up in it and, you know, really stressing the idea of, you know, blood versus loyalty and where your priorities are and like what life you want for himself or what life he wants for himself. But um, I, I really like this movie. Um, I don't, you know, again, the only actor I recognize was Barry, who I really like in this movie. And just in general, I think he's awesome and really exciting actor to, to, to watch. But um, I think, you know, this this movie comes out this week on, on video on demand. But um, I don't know if you're into like kind of those crime dramas, you know, you know, kind of character redemption, you know, who's he's had the seedy past where things have happened, maybe not so much in his favor, but he's got some new priorities in life. And it's like, you know, just that kind of push pull of where, you know, not only you want to see yourself go, um, but, you know, how those decisions can kind of dictate the life that, you know, follows for your kids, for your family and things like that. But it, I would I definitely recommend that if you have any if that sounds interesting at all. But, um, yeah, I think if you're looking forward here in the States, it might come up as the shadow of violence. Um, I think it's like a lot of the reviews I was reading. I think it's, it's called that here. But uh, I think it came out last year internationally. It was called Calm with Horses. But um yeah, it's good. I think I think you I think you both would probably dig it. Um, but man, I really like Bear, that guy Barry Kogan. He's going to be in the Eternals next year or whenever that comes out. But you know, loved him in American Animals, and he was in Dunkirk and um, Killing of a Sacred Deer. I don't know. I, I I think he's such a cool actor, exciting kind of kind of a odd actor. Yeah, um, he's got a really interesting look, and he definitely plays into a lot of the characters he plays. Definitely in this movie too, um, but yeah, definitely recommend that one too. I, I really liked it too. The only other thing I saw is a documentary called Jasper Mall. You guys heard of this? No, no, no. Um, it is a well. I mean, it's about a mall in a city called Jasper, Alabama. Uh, that's called Jasper Mall, and it's one of those sort of dying malls you know if you've been into a sort of small town mall in recent years you've seen a lot of empty uh spaces and you might feel a kind of depression if you grew up in the era where malls used to be hopping and now that malls are kind of i mean it's it's apparent when when you think about it why malls aren't doing as well as they used to but it used to be like the center of youth culture compared to now where it's mostly like old mall walkers and then weird stores that are open that are there because people still need some service or because department stores kind of held on for a while. And in some big malls, they still do. Um, and of course there are still malls that, that have a large crowd in them, but some of these out of the way malls, uh, um, are, are dying or dead. And this documentary is pretty much just a fly on the wall while a, you know, a couple stores close and, and you sort of see the clientele is, is, as I said, very old, um, so there's no question that this mall might be one of those dead malls within a few years. Uh, but what you do get is, is like no narration, no on screen text or anything, pretty much just setting you down in a situation where you start following around this guy who's kind of the security slash maintenance slash janitor guy at this mall. And you see his routine and you see kind of through his routine, you get to know some of the other people. Um, a very interesting thing about this guy is that he mentions that he used to own a zoo and he shows you pictures of his tigers. Um, and he seems like a guy who would have been a secondary character on Tiger King. Maybe he's like a little too mild mannered for that world, but it, it he, he totally fits in in that he's got this total like uh, Alabama accent. It sounds like at first, but then he starts sounding like maybe he comes from like Scotland or Australia or something. And he just has <laughs> adapted into a Southern accent because he's got another weird little tinge. And then it made me think maybe he's got like one of those mountain accents or something. Those can be really weird uh, amalgamations of different, of different twangs, but he's an interesting guy, but it's like a mild mannered version of a character from Tiger King who works at a mall and you're just kind of following him around. Um, uh, uh, and I, honestly, I think that if you get into the groove of this, and if you do remember that era that I remember when malls used to be the thing, uh, you'll find this a little sad. I mean, it's like, it's a little, it's, it's a little depressing and it's a little poignant. 
And the people that they show also are very much like rural Alabama types. So you have that. And sometimes it's hard to tell whether the camera is kind of poking fun at the people or not. But in general, if you like that kind of fly on the wall documentary that doesn't provide a lot of bombastic uh, commentary, it just kind of sets you down in an environment and lets you see different people that move throughout that world. Um, I, I think you guys would really dig it, especially if you have that little heartstring tug when you think about the mall as an experience, just if it was, as if, you know, it was a place to go. You could spend so much time there when I was a kid, you got dropped off and you'd see a bunch of people and you know, it was a hub. I'm kind of fascinated with that idea of, of dead malls. I don't know if there's been websites, different blogs, different pictures people share. There's always something kind of depressing to me about seeing a place that used to be so full of life and potential for somebody. And now it's just kind of a, a, a shell, you know, a big waste of space. Dang. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely want to watch that. That sounds really interesting. I, I definitely have that soft spot for, for the old school shopping mall, mall, whatever. Like even the one when they when they tore it down, the one I used to go to as a teenager, as a kid here in Owings Mills. Like when they tore it down in the past like five years, like I kind of snuck onto the property at night and stole some bricks from the food court, and I, I kept them just so I had something from that mall. Oh wow! Yeah. I had to, man. Just like I had, I had to have like a keepsake of like something. Like when they closed the like a movie theater that was down the street here that used to go to as a kid, I went up there and asked one of the guys if he could grab me some bricks from the building, just, just as like a collect, you know, just to hang on to. But yeah, the the shopping mall was like that. That mall was like a big thing, definitely for me growing up. So I, I would be very interested to see that documentary because yeah, like so the ones that are still around. You know, they're like this weird hodgepodge of like a flea market inside slash weird vendors like in ran. You know, it's like it's so random, the ones that are still around that it's it's just like a yeah, it's it's awkward to watch or even walk through at times when when I've found some that are still still running. So, yeah, I'm definitely curious to see that doc. Where'd you watch that, John? On Amazon, uh, you can watch. But it's also, I think, on Vimeo and YouTube, I believe. I I looked and saw it in a few places. Um, The one thing that's also kind of interesting, too, Steve, that that amalgam you're talking about, where it's like, this is a knife shop where they haven't even put up a sign. They just have like a banner that's like, just like tied to the front. (laughs) And and it's next to a cobbler (laughs) that's been there for 45 years or something like that. You know, that's the that's the weird combination you get. And this mall definitely has that feel. There's like a florist that's been there for 25 years. And then you sense that these other places are just, you know, kind of quietly closing down in the background during the footage that you're getting. Um, and you also get to know a few of the kind of old mall walkers or the people who hang out and play, play dominoes in the, in the food court area. And that, that too has its own little subculture, little bygone world where again, I was just looking at going, man, these are all old people now <laughs> like this, like, and I've been in a small town when I've been like, I'm going to go to the nearest mall and buy some socks or buy some whatever, you know, buy a belt. And it is, you see these malls that were never your mall, <laughs> but you see that it once was, yeah. and they still have like a gap or a, a you, you know, they used to still have maybe like a bookstore or a record store. Those things are largely gone, but you would have a sort of a hint of like, well, I can come here and while I'm here, I'll get a milkshake or something, or I'll walk around, but there's not much to do. And it, yeah, it starts to weigh on me. It really starts to, um, I'm the same way about when you're driving on a trip and you see little strip malls that have all but completely closed down, uh, you know, I know there are atrocities, but I'm also going like, oh man, <laughs> when somebody when somebody built that, they had such hopes uh, that they were gonna, you know, th- this is a fixture, and now it's just a, an ugly little useless building. And so many malls are are like that, you know. Yeah, that's sad. Can I talk about one TV show that I saw that I really want to get people to watch? Just one. Okay. Jeez, Ronald. Just one. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, OT. Fagnable, I, I looked up his name, um, is a guy that played in, uh, what the hell is the name of that show? Handmaid's Tale. And he's also supposedly going to be Taskmaster in the new um, Black Widow movie coming up. Um, this gentleman is... There's a Black Widow movie coming out? <laughs> the Black Widow movie that, that's coming out in 2025. Oh, oh, I think I heard something about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that's coming out in 2025. Supposedly that guy is uh, Taskmaster. I've never really watched Handmaid's Tale, but I heard he's incredible in the show. He has a show called Max that's now on Hulu. It's about a guy that was in a boy band and basically kind of plummeted into 
obscurity and he decides that he wants to come back and man it's it's done in a way that's just so funny man this guy is like you know how the you know those books we used to read as kids where you know you selected adventure and there was like do the good thing or do the awful thing imagine if there was a worse thing than the awful thing that you chose to do in that book that's what he does every single time <laughs> that he's asked to do something man he ruins things on a regular basis this guy is incredible in the show he has singing chops so you get to see him sing a little bit um steve you remember the the sister in gangs of london um the one that the main character was kind of having a situation with and they told him yeah he never yeah she plays his manager and um, their chemistry is incredible. Mm. She plays a totally different role. You know, she kind of played the sassy, seductive character. She's like a nerdy person trying to come up in this, this record label that has to take on this project of bringing this guy back. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Maloney from um, Law & Order is in it. And he kills it, man. It's a really fun show. It's light. It's like 20 minutes long. Wow. Um, the first season just showed on Hulu, and the second is uh, just finished airing in the UK. So Hulu's probably going to take it on once it's available for streaming, once that you know they have the rights to do so. But this is a fun, quick show that you'll probably watch a couple times that I suggest that everybody check out, man. Max, M-A-X-X-X. And there's a reason why it's XXX. He's ridiculous. He's like... It's really fun watch. It's on Hulu? Yeah, it's on Hulu. The last couple shows you told me to watch, Ronald, were uh, Never Have I Ever and Dave. So I'm going to say at this point, when you say watch a show, I'm honor bound to do it <laughs> because I owe it to myself. I owe it to myself. So yeah, I'll check out Max. Check it out, man. I think you're going to love some of the awkward scenes, man. There's, there's some things that I've never seen on in the show. Some things I've never seen before. Just what's the worst thing could ha that could happen in this space? And he he does it somehow. But yeah, it's it's a fun watch. Oh yeah, I, I recognize him now. I, I didn't. I I thought I knew who you're talking about from Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. But yeah, he's also isn't he also what else would I beyond Black Widow? I thought he was in something else or rumored to be. I know he's. Yeah, I don't know. Never mind. He's rumored to I be know, Taskmaster. I, that I that I know. I don't know if he's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that. I thought there was something else that he was like being talked about. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was Taskmaster. Maybe I'm mixing it up. But yeah, this looks good. Yeah, I, I remember seeing like a pop up for it on Hulu. Now that you say it, it was Hulu. Now that I'm looking at the poster art for it. Yeah, I think I think you'd enjoy it. Check it out and then give me give me a review, please. Cool. Yeah, definitely will. Well, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. It is, man. That we've watched and or plan to watch. This has been fun. Well, if you guys are good, we'll wrap this up and direct everybody again. Movieshmovie.com, Facebook.com slash Movieshmovie. If you have uh, any feedback for any of the movies that we've talked about or series that we've talked about, let us know what you thought of them. If you've watched them um, because of this episode, definitely comment on the Facebook page and let us know if we misled you, if we were <laughs> right, if we were wrong whatever let's just talk about it we're, we're open to the conversation um but yeah so be on the lookout for another episode another week or so we're, we'll try to get back to the every week thing um in the next episode as long as that uh works out for everybody here as always you've made our day bye So, now for some uh, uh, spoilers concerning The Rental. What did you guys think of the sort of actual resolution, the sort of actual horror movie content of this, which is to say that they've been surveilled all along by uh, a, a sort of opportunistic killer, a guy who plans ahead, but also then seems to kill people with whatever's on hand. Um, 
and uh, or at least has a few things he uses, but it's not like he has an axe or a chainsaw. He uses things like a hammer. What did you guys think of the sort of reveal of, of, of the killer and the fact that they've been watched all along by a killer and that they were kind of fucked from the moment they, they set foot in the place? Mm. Man, I love that. I loved it. I loved it too, man. Um, so it wasn't anybody that they had interacted with, right? No. No, I, I didn't miss anything. Okay, just making sure. I love the way they did that, though. Like it could, man. It's something about leaving things the mystery, and you know, I don't need everything overexplained. So you know, sometimes I feel like sometimes you can miss something. Hold, hold on for a second. Yeah. It's I guess it's hell. Oh wow. Yeah, it was hitting the. The like roof, the sunroof that we have, and it was making this crazy sound, and, I, and it sounded like something was happening upstairs with Aaron. Then I realized it was the sudden hail. I got thrown into this weird ass panic. We're talking about this scary ass shit. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the 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 idea that some things are left to mystery, and you know. I, I just I think that's so cool. I was just making sure I didn't miss anything, like you know somebody he may have been there before and something like that. But the idea you're right that there's this calculated killer that sets up this almost like kill site like Dexter, and I think that that introduced that that show introduced that whole ritual of murder to me. Um, you know you'd seen it in other movies, but seeing it in, in like something like Dexter. Seeing somebody lay out this sort of plan every everywhere that they go to kind of prey on people, I, I want to see a sequel. That's what it means to me, and not and not in a forced way. <laughs> I want to see this man move around and hurt other people. I know it sounds weird. These people are sort of targeted randomly. In this case, they they choose to rent the place that he has set up the cameras in. But the way that everything plays out, it makes you wonder how often does the the person who's renting the place get involved? How often do the people discover the cameras? How often, you know what I mean? All you know is that he's gone into other places and done the same thing, set up the cameras, like renting the place, which is the other thing that I have always thought about too, is anyone who's rented this place has had access to it for a week as yeah. well. So anyone who's rented could be sitting out there with a key and know the alarm code or whatever, you know, different things um, that are just creepy to enter into. And this movie kind of plays around with both of them which is to say maybe you rented a creepy house which is what they think at first but it's really that no you rented a house that was made creepy by someone who rented it prior to you coming here and they have maybe chosen you through some reason we don't know what the real reason for choosing the person was but at the end it maps to that template of well now that i've toyed with and killed these people now we're moving on and the suggestion of just doing this in another place uh, is it's it's like it's already on the plan is already afoot you know to to move on to the next one yeah. so it's like it's again it's these little it's like a, it's an opportunity killer but it's also uh, such a such a such forethought goes into it yeah when 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 you re- when it's revealed that like you know it's really not the landlord or whatever or the or the owner of the house and you start to see <clears throat> like all of these like red herrings like the room they had to get into and that was so creepy with the lock on it and the you know, it's just like all these little things that are planted to make you doubt or misdirect. And it's really, you know, it's it's done pretty effectively, you know, to this to the point that it's kind of like, a, not, I don't know, like, a, I don't know, it's a complete blind side. But you're like, wow, like, this is like fully random. They straight up just rented a murder box for the week. Like, they didn't even right. like have anything to do with the, the, the guy renting it or him being a racist, you know, or anything you know, like sexist, whatever it might be like. He just, or they just kind of chose the wrong place and the randomness of that. And like, you know, what you get to see, like kind of rolling into the credits and everything um, of, of like the next one or a prior one or whatever it's supposed to be. Um, and, you know, I don't know, that's, that's fucking scary. And I mean, like it, that, that idea of like, you know, setting it up just to wait, like it kind of reminds, I don't know if you ever, have you ever listened to like, uh any of like the true crime podcasts like or or read American Predator about Israel Keys. He's like yes. you know, this renowned serial killer who basically like would leave these murder kits like buried all over the north all over North America. And like when he would be in that town, he would basically get his little murder kit and he would like murder somebody. And like he was it's insane if you listen to that story. But this kind of reminded me of that a little bit. Yeah. Um 
in terms of like this guy just being able to rent something, set it up and just sit there and wait until he wants to like, you know, kill that family or that kid or, you know, whoever those teenagers or whoever it is that, it, you know, has rented it or, you know, whether their, their personal drama is, is kind of enabling him in terms of his manipulation of them, you know, like it does with this group of friends. Um, but yeah, just a really cool idea. It wouldn't have to go south so horribly for him to still come out of the shadows and right. kill people. That that shot at the end, uh, the, like the sure. last shot you see of him like coming out of the closet uh, or the or the bathroom or something yeah. so suddenly. Wow. And it made me think about how effectively mm. the sudden movement of this character was used. That when he attacked people and killed them, it was so sudden that it almost made you think the movie wouldn't do it that suddenly, you know, uh, like particularly the scene where Alison Brie right. seems like she's about to get killed. And then we come back to her car with the window smashed in and you know, it's, it can't be that simple, but you aren't sure if maybe she's going to be unconscious or she's going to be tied up or something like that. But no, she's just laying there on the ground with a couple of clearly fatal wounds to her face and head. Um, and we don't even know what kind of weapon he has at this point. Like I, th I couldn't tell at this point if he had a hatchet or something later, he has a hammer. We see him throw a, a toolbox into the car. So he's kind of like the tool box killer but he also could be a guy who just kills with whatever thing he can kind of get his hands on but the the idea that he moves so suddenly and he's got that old man mask on uh it's just thought through enough that it feels like it's both kind of poking fun at the idea of a killer with a distinctive mask who has like a modus operandi like this like a slasher film and yet it plays off of it's in that neighborhood of yeah it feels like a real life serial killer could do this um and that adds this uh, you know an element of cleverness to it that feels like again similar to the way i felt in fact stronger then because i really liked this movie too uh, but, you know, Creep yeah. is another movie that, that seems like, of. oh, this this could easily be sort of like sort of a halfway there kind of mumblecore attempt to kind of nod at horror tropes. Yeah. And then you get to the end of it and you're like, no, that was pretty much straight up a horror film. Right. And I think this is even more so like a really well-made entry in the genre that seems like they were taking it very seriously. Jo uh, Joe Swanberg and Dave Franco, when they conceived this, they seem to be thinking, I mean, everything we're talking about is totally uh, a deliberate feature that, that they, they create these characters that you you care just enough about um and some of them that you're very sympathetic towards and then when they die it really it doesn't matter that you cared about them you know the, the randomness of what happens to them is truly like it moves so fast and it's so brutal that all those plates that have been spinning as you said ronald um they come crashing down it doesn't matter that dan stevens uh you know messed around on his on his uh wife and it doesn't matter that that he and his brother are, are you know, going to be torn apart by this revelation of what's going on. It, none of that matters uh, yeah. <laughs> at the end. And that is that is really sad and scary. I, it's just a horror film that plays on real life stuff. And I love that. I love leveraging things that just are the unknown. I love that, man. I was going to just ask when, when you mentioned, John, when you mentioned like the toolbox killer, did, did, did you did you take it that he basically was making it look like Toby? I mean, well, uh, Taylor like did that since that was his toolbox and his truck and he put like everything in the bed of his truck and everything like they was setting it up to like that he had killed those people I, I couldn't tell how much that was like an incidental part of the of just cleaning up the end and that was the best way to handle things or if that was like his plan all along or if that somehow played into his hands mm -hmm. or even where this guy goes next right. I mean I could picture okay. him driving just down the road and leaving that truck up at Taylor's place right, right? and then leaving and and then yeah definitely creating some confusion about what would have happened but but at some point it seems like if people keep dying in rental houses they would notice that the this guy had rented it before, right, but you right. know, maybe he uses a different name or something. You know, we don't really know what his what his overall shtick is, or or how long he waits. That's the other thing we don't sure. know is how long yeah. he takes to, like, once he rents the place, does he does he spring it on the next renter, or does he wait two three weeks? Does he only come when it seems like it's somebody interesting? Like that's the one thing I couldn't tell, and it really did seem like he kind of hit the jackpot with this group of people because they have some real drama going on. But most people would be just kind of boring because they wouldn't sure. have you know eventually you would just be like well i guess i'll start killing them <laughs> because they yeah. they wouldn't be suspicious of the landlord and they wouldn't you know there would be different things going on um well that was should, do we have do we need a special ending for a stinger people just heard the this song and then they heard this and now we're about to go back and finish up the actual show so do we say anything at the end of a stinger we just kind of peter out You've been stung. <laughs> <laughs> buzz, buzz, bitch. <laughs> 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 <laughs>